The Office of Financial Research was started with the Dodd-Frank Act in 2010. In the financial crisis, we learned a couple of important lessons. One, uh, we didn't really understand completely the extent of vulnerabilities in our financial system that enabled shocks to spread across the system from one part to another. We didn't understand the extent of maturity transformation and risk-taking in the financial system. Another key important lesson that we learned was that we didn't know and have the tools to measure financial activity in all of its components. And so these gaps, both in analysis and in measurement, uh, spurred the creation of the Office of Financial Research as part of the Dodd-Frank Act in 2010. Let me give you three examples of where our work has shown uh, that we might, uh, we might see uh, threats to financial stability and vulnerabilities in the financial system. One is in the area of securities financing transactions and short-term wholesale funding. That sort of funding, which comes through um, repurchase agreements, also known as repo, uh, was subject to runs and fire sales uh, in the financial crisis. And while there's been a lot of progress in strengthening uh, securities financing markets, they are still vulnerable to, uh, to those problems. In an effort to uh, improve that, uh, the resilience uh, of those markets, the OFR is filling a, a data gap in so-called bilateral repo repo transactions that take place individually between parties without being cleared uh, through a third party. And so those transactions are, are typically, are, or have been in the past, opaque. Uh, and we haven't had any data to speak of to track those transactions. By filling that gap, we can do a better job of understanding how those markets behave, both in normal times and under stress, and that's really the goal uh, of that, uh, of that uh, data collection project. But once we have the data, then we can do the analysis, uh, and we've already done some analysis, of how these markets behave, uh, both uh, in normal times and under stress, and we can validate whether or not uh, our work uh, is accurate. And we can, make, we can help policymakers uh, come up with the recommendations to how to strengthen those parts of the financial system. So that's the first example. The second example is one that has been dealt with uh, to some extent, also in uh, short-term funding markets, namely in money funds. As you know, money market funds um, are liquid uh, assets for the investor, uh, and they uh, have promised a return, and they have also promised uh, redemption uh, not at par, but investors have perceived in the past that the redemption would come uh, at par. In other words, there would be no loss of value in these money funds. In the crisis, we learned that that wasn't the case, if we didn't know it beforehand. Um, and there was a big exodus to the tune of trillions of dollars from money funds when those funds were at risk. Data were collected by the SEC uh, to help inform policymakers where the risks might lie in money funds. And we've taken those data and turned them into a money market mutual fund monitor that enables people to pinpoint exactly what's going on in money funds, who the investors are, who the issuers are, how the funds are managed, how they relate to, to each other, what happens under certain circumstances, so when the rules change um, or when certain exposures become more risky, what happens to the flows uh, in those funds, we can see and pinpoint exactly where those, uh, where those issues uh, might be. A third example lies in central clearing counterparties, or what are known as CCPs. CCPs uh, and central clearing offer benefits for our financial system because they enable users to net financial transactions and net the risk um, by having them centrally cleared through a common counterparty. That's the benefit, but there is also a potential risk that's created because they don't eliminate risk. They concentrate it in the CCP. So it's very important that the CCP 
have sufficient resources to be resilient in the face of shocks. Stress tests are used to assess that resilience. They're being performed by other organizations, but our job is to assess the validity uh, of those stress tests and to ensure that we really feel uh, that they are telling us the right story about the resilience of CCPs. The OFAR contributes to uh, assessing and monitoring threats to financial stability uh, in several ways. In our financial stability monitor, we look at five buckets of risk, macroeconomic risk, funding and liquidity risk, credit risk, market risk, and contagion risk. Five functional areas that are important to look at every day uh, and try to report out what those risks look like uh, to the financial, the members of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, to the public at large, to the Congress, and to our global counterparts who are generally interested in the same kinds of risks that we are. The Financial Stability Oversight Council is the group of financial regulators in the United States. When Dodd-Frank was started, uh, the lawmakers had a choice of whether or not to change dramatically uh, the system or to create a council so that all the members of the financial regulatory community in the United States would come together and talk about financial stability. Because financial stability is everyone's responsibility. But each of those regulators, each of those policymakers, has different authorities uh, and uh, different mandates that they need to fulfill. So, for example, the Federal Reserve makes monetary policy, also worries about financial stability. The Securities and Exchange Commission, another member, uh, is the overseer of markets and many market participants and has a mandate to pursue market functioning and integrity, investor protection, uh, and related issues. Coming together brings uh, the perspective from all of those regulators into the council so that they can look across the financial system uh, and see where the threats might lie. Our relationship to the, uh, the council um, is really very simple. By statute, um, we are charged with uh, serving the needs of the council. That means providing data, providing analysis, uh, so that they can take steps to act on the vulnerabilities that we see in the financial system. One of the OFR's key mandates is uh, to improve the quality, the scope, and the accessibility uh, of financial data. And when we look at data scope, that means that we have to look and see whether we have sufficient data uh, to answer the key questions that relate to financial stability that we're being asked uh, every day. Sometimes uh, we have the authority to fill data gaps that others in our financial regulatory community do not have because the source of those data may not come under their, uh, the scope of their regulation. So we work together to try to fill those gaps. But that's only uh, the first step. Then I think it's very important to engage with the industry to try to understand whether their perception of where those gaps are and how we should go about filling those gaps really aligns with ours. Early engagement with industry is a very important part of this because after all, they're gonna be the suppliers of the data. And then the last step is to go through a process uh, so that the public has a chance to comment uh, on any data that we might collect, uh, any gap that we might fill, um, and that process may take some time, but that's the right way to do it so that everyone's in agreement that the gaps that are being filled are the right ones, um, and we're using those data to answer the right question. Very importantly, as is the case for the OFR generally, it's important that we don't duplicate the work of others, that we complement the work of others. That's true in data, uh, and only by checking uh, with our counterparts and with the public can we be sure uh, that data that we uh, are trying to collect or gaps that we're trying to fill don't exist somewhere else. The quality of, of financial data is extremely important to us because uh, without quality data, then we're not going to be able to make good decisions. So how do we assure data quality? Well, data quality means that the data are fit for purpose. 
that we can aggregate them uh, if they're very detailed and granular, as we say, um, that uh, we know exactly what the data represent. And we know, for example, who is exposed to whom, uh, who owns what, uh, and uh, what the nature of the relationships between two parties to a financial transaction might be. The legal entity identifier is a tool to um, precisely identify who are the parties to a financial transaction. And once we identify our detailed data in that way, then we can be very sure that we're getting high quality, accurate data. If you go back to the financial crisis and think about Lehman Brothers, when Lehman collapsed, both market participants and policymakers in many cases didn't know who was exposed to Lehman because the data were not identified in the precise way that the LEI permits. Now that we have that tool, and there are about 500,000 in use and growing, we can do a much better job of identifying who is exposed to whom. The process of orderly resolution that was put into Dodd-Frank and that is used in other forms around the world requires uh, that one understand what parts of a financial company and what parts of the financial system uh, are weak and what parts uh, are strong. Because orderly resolution requires uh, that the parts that are weak uh, either be strengthened or be uh, resolved in, in one way or another. So in order to identify those uh, and separate those parts out, it's very important that uh, policymakers be able to, to identify exactly who they are. Equally, it's important that they understand the relationship between parents and subsidiaries. If you have a subsidiary of an organization that is troubled and whose material financial distress might spill over into the rest of the organization. You have to know exactly what business they're in, where the weaknesses are, and how they relate to uh, the parent. Using uh, standards like the legal entity identifier help I identify those relationships as well as the in in individual entities. Financial linkages are uh, extremely important for our work in assessing uh, where the threats are in the financial system. The financial system is a global system. And so it's intrinsic to that analysis that we uh, look across and outside our borders in order to see what the impact of uh, events overseas might have on the US uh, economy and the US financial system. It's equally important to think about developments in the United States and how they might spill over into the global financial system and indeed come back uh, to us. So we can make the most of those linkages by collaborating with our global counterparts, making sure that uh, we talk to each other, that we compare notes, that we share data appropriately uh, so that we can be looking at the same facts, and that we keep communicating with each other. So if we spot something uh, that we say something about it to them, and vice versa. Is after all, financial markets are global. Uh, financial institutions, in many cases, are also global. But our authorities are national, so collaboration with our global counterparts is essential in looking at those risks. In our 2016 Financial Stability Report, we identify four basic themes that help discuss and think about where the risks might lie in the financial system. The first arises from uh, vulnerabilities that might originate overseas. Global economic or financial developments that have an impact on the US financial system. The second uh, derives from uh, vulnerabilities related to uh, a very low, still low, interest rate environment and low volatility environment, which uh, to our way of thinking has spurred a lot of uh, reach for yield behavior. Um, and if market circumstances change, then that might create risk to the financial system. The third area um, relates to uh, risk to financial institutions in general. We've done a lot. Policymakers have done a lot 
to make financial institutions and the system more resilient, but vulnerabilities persist. One of the key vulnerabilities uh, from our standpoint is very clearly cybersecurity shocks and the impact that they might have either on an individual institution or on the system as a whole. The last of these four themes uh, relates to uh, the ability to have the right data uh, in order to answer the kinds of questions that we need to answer. Lacking high quality, comprehensive data uh, with sufficient detail means that we're not gonna be able to answer the, the questions that we're trying to answer uh, about the vulnerabilities in the financial system and how we might go about mitigating those vulnerabilities.